Recording in progress. All right, um, everybody, thanks for joining. Um, I'd like to introduce Robert. Like to introduce um, Robert. Um, Robert, why don't you Robert, give why us don't a quick you background, quick of background of your career with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department and then we can kind of move into the the discussion. The discussion. Well, sure. Uh, first of all, say thanks for having me on. Um, glad I could be here and talk a little bit about fisheries here on the North Coast. Um, as Pat said, my name is Robert Bradley, and I am the district fish biologist for the North Coast. Um, and I'll show everybody in a little bit what where that is exactly. Uh, I've been the district biologist just about eight years now. And prior to that, I was an assistant biologist in this uh, district for about 14 years. Um, and all together, I've been in Tillamook going on 26 years now, uh, working a little bit in our marine program prior to that. Uh, before I came to Tillamook, I was in a variety of seasonal positions and multiple capacities. Um, so overall, about 33 years here with the department. Uh, most of which has been here in Tillamook working for the district. So I've uh, been around a while, probably a few people on here tired of me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Pat wanted me to come on here. We talked about um, talking about our North Coast uh, steelhead fisheries, uh, hatchery fish and our wild fish. And so my topic or talk tonight is going to be centered around winter steelhead but uh, happy to try to answer other questions if we have time, if, if folks are interested. All right. So obviously the uh, North Coast is a, is a uh, popular place for a lot of people. Um, in particular, we've got the winter steelhead um, season going on. Um, why don't you start with what you're hearing um, on the North Coast rivers in terms of how steelhead fishing has been and, um, and we can move from there. Well, it's been an interesting season. Um, overall, I'd say it looks like our returns are, are doing okay. Um, fishing has generally been pretty good when uh, conditions allow, and I think that's the key to this winter so far is that our windows of opportunity have been uh, kind of hit or miss. Uh, most of January, especially on the bigger rivers, was uh, blown out or real high or real icy and you couldn't get here. Uh, so little very little fishing opportunity in in january uh some of our early fisheries further north uh, we've had pretty decent returns in uh the case of the lower columbia and and some of the other rivers uh, of the early stock a little more fishing opportunity there because the things got started a little bit earlier uh, but really lately the the fishing uh, down here and the where we have later returns of wilson and the stucca has picked up and uh, when the conditions have been favorable, there's some pretty good darn, pretty darn good fishing that we've been seeing, um, okay. as evidenced by you know, folks that we run into, reports we get, and and a lot of times I judge by our wild brood stock collections, which have been going pretty steady when we had some conditions, had the right good. conditions. That's that's so, a good, good segue into one of the topics we want to talk about is the uh, brood stock programs. Um, obviously the two are the Nestucca and the Wilson. Um, can you give us a quick synopsis of the, of the history of that and then kind of, um, meld that into, um, what your, uh, what the staff there is, how they're kind of approaching it and just kind of an overview of, of the, uh, Broodstock program. Yeah. So just one clarification, we actually have three programs now. Um, one, the, the Wilson and the Nestucca are the big ones. Wilson first started in the late nineties. Uh, the Nestucca started in the early two thousands. Uh, so they've been long established for quite a while. Uh, about five years ago or so we fully transitioned out of our, uh, for a number of years, we had two different stocks and the early, the old Alce stock, we used to call them and the wild brood. It was a combination of the two. Um, and about five years or maybe six years ago now, we fully transitioned over the wild brood and, and 
uh, the Wilson, the Stucka are hundred percent wild brood and, and all the fish coming back now are from those stocks. So, um, pretty much gone away from that November or December fishery at this point, although we do try to collect fish, uh, early in the season to, to hope string that out a little bit longer. The other one we've done more recently, uh, we started about five years ago is a partial program on the North Fork Nehalem. Uh, and so we reduced the the early stock fish that we released there and replaced them with uh, a wild brood stock. So now 25,000 smolts out of that. And I, I have a presentation here, I can go over all the numbers, but a portion of that program is, is the wild brood stock out of the North Fork Nehalem. And, uh, you know, we're starting to see return to those the last couple of years and, and uh, should be ramping up now that we've got multiple age classes coming back. Great. So one of the things that CCA that we kind of uh, hang our hats on is, you know, um, hatchery, you know, good hatchery um, programs. And can you talk to the uh, effectiveness of the, um, the brew stock programs um, on the North Coast? Well, they're very popular with folks and and all of the indications are that the return to the angler is much higher than any of our old hatchery stocks used to be. Um, we've done some research in the Nestucca and there was some down in the Alsea, I think, but they pretty much all showed we were getting two and a half, three times the catch uh, on those hatchery stocks than we were on the that early, old, early returning stock. And multiple reasons for that probably, but the fact that they come in over a longer period and oftentimes with better fishing conditions in the spring uh, and the fact that they don't ripen up and spawn right away, they're available to the angler longer. I think all of those contribute to that. So, you know, all in all, I'd, I'd say it's probably the most popular hatchery program we have and, and our angler collections allow us to get people involved and have a, have a stake in it, so to speak, in terms of, the future return and, and ability to catch more hatchery fish down the line. Sure. Um, so I think a lot of us um, remember that um, back when it was kind of like the Thanksgiving kickoff, you know, you could always kind of anticipate a um, catching a steelhead on Thanksgiving around Thanksgiving. That's obviously changed. Um, what, what are the peak periods um, for angler retention in terms of the hatchery broodstock programs? Uh, well, before we get months, I guess. is what yeah, I would, yeah. So I, I want to point out that, that we haven't gone away from that totally. If we're talking the Wilson, the Stucca, yeah, it's, it's a later fishery now that really gets going in January and peaks in February and March and then tapers off in April. But we've retained early hatchery returns in our lower Columbia tributaries in the Canica and the North Fork and the Halem. So there is that opportunity for a Thanksgiving or even mid-November steelhead all the way into, you know, they're petering out about now, those stocks. Uh, not very many of fresh fish left in those systems right now. Um, but where we have the wild broodstock fish, we're just really ramping up into the peak of the season right now over the next say two months. Perfect. Okay. So Robert, you have a presentation for us and then um, we'd like to have you uh, show that. And then um, after that, we'll, we can open it up for questions. I have a few more questions that I'd like to follow up, but um, why don't you go ahead and um, kind of give us your, uh, your, your presentation. All right. I saw one question pop up that I know I'm going to answer along the way here. So just be patient with me. I'll go ahead and share my screen and let me know if It pops up for you there. That works. Okay. Um, we got it. Good. Uh, so I'm just going to, I'll just jump in here, Pat, if, and just go on through this. And then when I get to the end, we can revert, go back to questions if that's all right. If anything pops up along the way, if you feel like I need to address, I, I can do that as well. But I'm going to just give folks a uh, kind of a, Hopefully my, uh oh excuse me, Robert. 
But it, if people do have questions, go to your chat and submit the questions in the chat, and then Pat will see them, and we'll try to get to as many as we can before uh, seven thirty. Thank you. So just uh, real quick here, I'll go through what I've got laid out in the presentation, and then we'll get into the meat of it here. Um, I'm just, like I mentioned earlier, I'll give you a little location here where we're talking, where the North Coast District entails. Uh, then I'm going to talk about, I figured this group would be more most interested in the hatchery stuff, so I'm going to start with our hatchery programs. We'll go through them from north to south, uh, and we'll uh, got some information on what kind of harvest we see from these programs. Uh, we'll talk about, I was at, you know, Pat, you asked me about the wild steelhead abundance on the North Coast. So I'll give you an overview of what we, what we do in that regard. Uh, and then we'll have that time for questions. So let me just jump in here. Uh, this is a, a map of our watershed district uh, from north to south. These are the basins where we release hatchery winter steelhead and, and fisheries occur. Our district actually also includes the Neskowin Creek Basin, which is just to the south of the Nestucca, but there's not a really significant steelhead fishery in there. Um, so when we're talking tonight, this is the area I'm focusing on. This is where I have some responsibility and, and where I oversee programs uh, with our winter steelhead. Uh, and so I'm going to jump into to talk about our hatchery programs on the North Coast. Um, little plug for my daughter here this is a fish she caught a few years ago but it's a it's a good example of uh of the type of fish that that are produced in these wild broodstock programs uh especially so again uh we'll start up north uh in the lower columbia we release hatchery steelhead in three different basins those are big creek knack creek and the north fork of the Klaska nine uh these are Big Creek stock. It's an early returning stock. So that November to January timeframe is when they're coming in, probably peaks in late December, early January. Uh, and I've got the numbers here and the release locations that we'll go through. Uh, Big Creek 60,000, that's where the, the fish are spawned. So that's the higher release there. Uh, 60,000, then Nat Creek 40 and North Fork Class and I'm 40. All, all the releases in the lower Columbia occur at the hatcheries. They're uh, very short systems and, and some of the best access is around the hatcheries. So um, makes the most sense just to release them right there in this case. Uh, coming down the coast a little bit, uh, in the Canicum River near Seaside, we use a North Fork Nehalem, the early returning stock there. We released 40,000 smolts. And I should point out that this number, these are our production goals, 40,000. So obviously that exact number varies around that uh, a little bit, but this is the goal, 40,000. They're released at three different sites along the river. Uh, for those familiar with the Nicanicum, is the rock pit, the, it's now Knife River, I think. Uh, the uppermost release occurs at the, what's called the Black's Bridge at the Soapstone Mainline. And then the middle release site is in a tributary called Bulmer Creek, which is just across from uh, the county park there at Cloochee Creek. Uh, let's see here. Moving on further south uh, on the North Fork Nehalem. We use two different stocks, like I mentioned, our early returning stock. Our goal is to release 65,000 of those. We release those at two different sites, one at the hatchery, one mid-river at the county line bridge. Uh, we used to release some down at uh, Aldervale at the head of tide, but we found that we didn't get really good uh, contribution to the fishery from those fish as much as the others. So we, we discontinued that release site. Uh, and as I mentioned a few years ago, we initiated a, a portion of the program as a wild brood stock. That's 25,000 smolts that we released or our goal for that program. Uh, those fish are all released at the hatchery, uh, mostly because we'd like to collect some of them when they come back in case we need them as, as uh, backup brood stock. And uh, also they, that's one of the better contributions to the fishery that way. 
Uh, and I should mention this, this is only the third year we're getting fish back from those releases. The first two releases, uh, we had some issues with diseases and we didn't meet our production goals. That was one of the other reasons for releasing all the fish at the hatchery is it's a small number. So we didn't want to subject them to any more stress than they'd already been through. Uh, so moving on to the south, this is the big one. Uh, Wilson River, our goal is to release 150,000 smolts uh, per year. Uh, it's all the wild brood stock now. The, other, the old LC early returning stock was discontinued a few years back. All the returns for the last few years have been off nothing but the wild brood. So again, 150,000 fish. We have four release sites throughout the river. They're released in the lower river at the acclimation pond the Brown Milepost 4 on Highway 6, if folks aren't familiar. Uh, we also release at the Mills Bridge launch and the Siskiville launch. And then about 25% of the fish are re actually released up in the South Fork of the Wilson. We have a rearing pond up there at the prison camp. And so we direct release that group right out of the camp there. So there we in that way, we spread some fish out throughout the whole river basin for, for you know, the that upper Wilson is primarily bank angler show, uh, but this provides those folks up there some opportunity at some hatchery fish as they make their way back up river. And then uh, to the furthest to the south here on the Nestucca, same thing, we use a wild brood stock. We transitioned away from the early returning stock a few years back, uh, nothing but the wild brood fish returning now. Uh, the Nestucca gets 140,000 smolts altogether. We release 90,000 of those spread equally among three sites in the main stem. That's the Farmer Creek boat ramp, the first bridge boat launch, and then a tributary called Bays Creek, which is just upstream of the fifth bridge, uh, if folks know where that is. Uh, and then the remainder are released from the hatchery on three at uh, Three Rivers. Uh, about a mile and a half up three rivers out of Hebo. Uh, and so that uh, that provides us an opportunity to have a fishery in three rivers, first of all, but also collect some fish uh, back at the hatchery in case we need them uh, for brood stock as backup, uh, which does happen in some years. I, our goal, I should have probably mentioned this earlier, Pat, but our goal in these wild brood programs is to use 100% wild fish every year. Um, most years we're able to make that. Uh, in recent years, we've had some issues with survival in the hatchery with various diseases. So we've spawned, we do spawn a number of hatchery fish uh, as backup in case we need to supplement the wild fish if our survival is, is low. And, you know, we prefer to use all wild fish and make our production goals that way. But if we have to use the hatchery fish uh, as a backup in order to reach our production goals, that's something that we uh, we plan to do just in case. And uh, it, we've had to a couple of times, most of the time we're able to make it uh, without doing that. But it's nice to have that uh, in your back pocket just in case. Uh, so just to give a folks uh, an idea of what kind of harvest we're seeing from these fisheries, uh, these are these are catch stats from 2014 to now. Uh, I thought these were most relevant. Probably could have even shortened up that time frame with the transition of stocks, but uh, as you can see, we're cruising right along. The Wilson and the Stucca are the are the two big ones. The Wilson typically being the most uh, uh, or highest harvest, I guess, I should say, uh, you know, plus or minus 5,000 fish in, in recent years and approaching 7,000 estimated in one year or over 7,000 actually. Uh, Nestucca typically is the, is the next highest, although the North Fork Nehalem some years uh, rivals it. I, I think the Nestucca could actually put out more fish, but as many of you know, the, the river tends to drop more slowly and I would say on a typical year, there's probably a few less fishable days down there. Uh, and then, uh, you know, further north, uh, 
Mechanicum and the Lower Columbia Tribs, which I lumped all together here, uh, they put out or you know, their catches pushing a thousand fish in a lot of years or a few several hundred in, in anyway. So a lot smaller scale up there and uh you know a little return, but still provide some good small stream fisheries, I think. And I'm going to transition over to talking about wild fish at this point. Um, question was, what kind of uh, status do we have on our wild populations on the North Coast? Um, before I jump into some numbers, just let me give you an idea of how we get to those, to those numbers. Um, the abundance estimates across the North Coast are done at what we call the stratum level which means across the entire district. So from Neskowin all the way to the Nicanicum on the coast here, uh, or the lower Columbia tributaries uh, up north. Um, they're done by red surveys. So spawning grounds, we go out, count the number of reds that the fish are making. You can see in the picture here in the background, a steelhead laying on a red where they've dug the gravel up. Uh, the surveyors mark those reds throughout the season and, and in an effort to tally the number of red, actual number of reds uh, created throughout the season in each of their survey reaches. Um, so that red number that is then expanded across the, uh, for the habitat across the North Coast. Uh, and then that's further expanded. Uh, the total number of reds is then expanded by uh, uh, a uh, predetermined number of, of fish per red to account uh, to provide that total estimate of spawners. I kind of stumbled through that, but I hope that made sense. Um, we've, we know from previous research that each red uh, equates to a certain number of fish. And so the total reds can be expanded to the number of spawners. Um, and now that's, that's our, uh, our project across the North Coast. We have a also have a long-standing survey on the Salmonberry River that's primarily done by volunteers uh, from Trout Unlimited and some other, some steelheaders and some other folks. Uh, but uh, that's specific to the Salmonberry River uh, and that an estimate for the number of fish in there is derived by an expansion of the peak red count uh, and then expanded for to create an estimate the number of actual spawners. Uh, so it's a little bit different methodology there, but it's it's somewhat useful in monitoring that particular population uh, that's of interest to a lot of folks. So Robert, can I ask you a real quick question on red counts? So you you sure. you, you said you, you're able to estimate. So like from each red, how many steelhead do you think um, comes from that? Uh, I believe the expansion is like 1.1 or 1.2 fish per red, something along that line. Okay. Uh, I don't have that right in front of me, but it's it's one point something. It's not two or three fish per red. It's and I think a lot of that's because each, for one thing, females can dig more than one red, and also males can spawn with multiple females. So it's not a one-to-one -one type of ratio where you get two fish per red. So um, I could certainly look that information up and, uh, and in, the, in the reports that we have, but it's, uh, you know, that's on our research side of things. I just get the numbers and that's what sure. I work with. So, uh, but I believe it's 1.1 or 1.2, something like that. Uh, and then so when we translate all that into spawners, here's what we're looking at for the North Coast. Uh, again, the uh, the blue line here represents our oasis or spawning ground surveys across the stratum North Coast. And you can see we run uh, plus or minus 25,000 spawners, wild spawners uh, in the last few years, 2023. It was a pretty good year. It was in the upper 30s, and we surpassed the 40,000 fish mark once back in 2015. Uh, and we've also had a couple of years that dropped off there, probably associated with El Nino's and that sort of thing, I'm guessing. But 
uh, we definitely have dropped down there for a little bit and then we've rebounded the last oh, four years or so. Uh, the lower line here, the orange is a salmon berry. As you can see, it runs fairly consistent. Uh, I think that's somewhere around a thousand fish, low thousands. Um, I would like to point out for if you notice the drop off in 22 and 23, I'm not sure that's a real drop off. We had access issues due to snow and weather. And so the surveys were not done in the normal time frames. So there's a good chance that we missed some spawners there and, and that number is a little bit lower. Um, but that's, uh, those are the numbers that were derived from the counts that we were able to get. Um, but I'm not, I, I kind of tend to think though, we, I mean, especially 2023, we really missed the timing on that. There was just too much snow and we couldn't even get in there to do some of the April counts, which is when, when we start doing those normally. So, uh, based on that, I would guess that we were a little bit, we were just late getting the, and missed the actual peak counts in those years. Uh, but that happens sometimes. So, uh, let's see here. So a lot of this information that I just went through is available on our website. And I know this is uh, a lot to see, but I know you're going to re you're recording this, and it'll be available for folks to look up. But they just go to the OFW website and look under our conservation plan uh, page. You'll find uh, uh, links to these, or there's the links, but you'll find these reports, and you can read uh, the, about the information I just provided, or or even a uh, lot more detailed information about our not only our winter steelhead but other species. And of course, if anybody has any questions, we can dive into some of that now, or I've put my contact information on here. So if folks want to follow up later with any questions, uh, I'm happy to take those on and, uh, and answer them the best I can. Well, let me, let me start with the Trask, um, just, just because it's, it's right there in your wheelhouse. And um, what kind of return do we get from on wild steelhead at the Trask, and, and do you get any strays of hatchery fish back to that river? So, we the help the Trask has a healthy wild population, just like across the north coast here. I think we don't monitor it specifically; it's incorporated in the overall stratum level um, survey uh, regime. So. I can't speak specifically to the Trask in terms of numbers of fish, but there is a good population of wild steelhead in there. Second part of your question, yes, we see hatchery strays in there. It varies from year to year. This picture right here is a hatchery fish from the Trask River, actually. Um, I think I put that there because that's the largest hatchery steelhead I've ever caught. Uh, but um, it varies from year to year. Um, if you were to break out the, what I shared for the, the Wilson there, you could also go over the Trask and look from year to year what the harvest rate or harvest number is estimated to be. And I think it varies from year to year a little bit. And some years more fish show up over there, more hatchery fish show up. Some years it's less. Um, there are no hatchery fish released in the Trask River, uh, but they are a lot of them are raised at the Trask Hatchery, so it would make sense that some wander back over there on occasion. Jim uh, Kennedy has a question. Uh, not a question, just a comment. We've still got a lot of time and there's a lot of questions popping in. I just want everybody to know the uh, communication committee is we're, we're actually working on addressing the questions that don't get answered during these zoom meetings so if we don't get to your questions be patient we're trying to figure out a way that afterwards either through the recorded uh, videos that we can get everybody's questions eventually answered so okay thanks for uh, participating well scott gordon had a, a question what are the chances of increasing the broodstock releases Uh, 
in general or are we talking about a specific place? Well, let's, let's go general. Well, in over the long haul, I'd say, well, I guess the short, quick answer is there is no possibility of doing that right away. Um, we are kind of tied with our conservation plan and, and the, the releases adopted in rule at the moment. So nothing's going to change unless that rule is changed or that when that or when that plan comes up for review. Um, there's some challenges to doing more fish in some areas. A place like the North Fork Nehalem, we could certainly look at uh, swapping the some more of the fish out, some of the early fish for the later fish, and keeping the overall production the same. Um, but logistically, most of our hatcheries are at capacity. In fact, all of our hatcheries are pretty much at capacity given water budgets, all of that. The only way we would be able to do, you know, if we could get past the rule making and, and, you know, if we chose to, for example, to raise more fish for the Wilson, um, at this point, we would have to figure out how are we going to do that logistically because we don't have the space or the water for those fish, uh, especially during the pinch points in the summertime. So, you know, would we give up spring Chinook or coho or something else to make space for those fish? Um, so it's a tough question. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I, I would not see at this point any room for releasing more steelhead than we are now. Uh, for the most part, uh, without doing some kind of juggling act, and certainly not until this conservation plan is is uh, revised. Is there any works that have been uh, being revised? Is that a possibility, or is that something that? Yeah, it, it's on. Uh, the intention is to be on a, like a t twelve year cycle, and so the twelve years is coming up in twenty twenty six. So the discussions for any changes or revisions to that will be starting sometime soon and, and hopefully ready to go by back to the commission in 2026 and thereabouts. From a sport angler um, uh, perspective, is there anything that we can do to affect change on that, on that plan? Well, if you're, I'm not sure what the, the process is going to be when we, at this point, that's all handled out of our headquarters. If you recall, when the plan was first developed, there were some uh, teams that were set up to give input uh, and it went through a very lengthy process for public input. And so uh, there will be opportunity for some public input in some form or fashion. So, you know, stay in touch and when the time comes, get involved in whatever that looks like. Um, Ty, you had a question. Do you want to jump in with that? Yeah, sorry, guys. I had to mute. Yeah, Robert, I was just curious to, on uh, the Nastaka. Is the 50,000 Three Rivers Steelhead, is that a new stock? Is that an F1 brood derived from the F1 wild brood stock, or is that the traditional Alci stock just relabeled out uh three river no, stock the lc stock is completely gone these are all uh wild brood nastucca basin wild brood stock fish some of the parents might be returning hatchery fish uh, but they're all descended from these wild from the wild brood stock at this point okay cool thank you for the answer uh Jim uh, wants to know, is there any data on this year's Springer's return? Uh, we don't have any forecasts that are made for the coast. Yeah, okay. And we sometimes correlate with the Columbia, sometimes don't. So um, about the only thing I could say there is that we saw an increase in our return of Spring Chinook last year to the hatchery. Uh, still not where we'd like it to be, but um, we don't we don't know until they show up. So if you want to be optimistic, maybe we're on an increasing trend, but we really don't know until they get here. 
Okay. So um, talk about coho. This last year, uh, we've had a really good coho run on the North Coast. Um, and I think you said earlier in a conversation with me that you would be able to have an idea of what this coming year is going to look at look like. Do you are you able to answer that right now? Yeah, we uh, so the the if folks follow on the uh, ocean salmon season processes are just starting to ramp up including some of the forecasting for this coming year. Um, I just got hold of the forecast for coho for this coming year. Uh, we're, the total ocean abundance is estimated to be 403,000 hatchery coho and 233,000 wild coho, uh, coastal wild coho for a total of 636. Um, I will point out that uh, the PFMC folks, the technical team, adopted a new forecast model starting this year. So um, a little bit untested at this point, but maybe more in line with what we've been seeing the last few years. Even last year, we overestimated what was out there, at least for hatch, especially for hatchery fish. Um, but also for wild fish by a little bit, it looks like. So, you know, that's uh, 401,000 or 403,000. It's not a great number on the hatchery fish. The two, 233 on the wild is about what we've been seeing in recent years. So not, not too shabby there. I'm not sure how that's all going to play out when it comes to the ocean season and what's left over for potential wild coho fisheries in the bays. Um, but that'll all play out over the next few months. And you compare well, that I to mention, do, before I, before we move on from that, the hatchery coho here in North, on the North coast and the Trask and the North Fork and Halem, we also switched to a wild brood stock, uh, four years, starting four years ago. We got the first returns of those hatchery fish this past fall. Um, it looks to me, some preliminary information I've seen is that the catch of those fish went up like what we'd hoped. Uh, maybe not as much as it could have. I think, you know, if I was going to spread the word about hatchery co on the North Coast, I'd say, you know, we, we've moved away from that early returning fish that came back in September, October, and now we've got fish coming from as early as September, but a lot of in October, November, and even into December. And so there's still, there's some extended opportunity to get into bright hatchery coho through the fall now, both in the bay and in up in the river environment. So and, and what would you say yeah. like a, a, a typical average size coho coming in, uh, returning in um, October, November is? We saw some pretty good catches this, this last past year so. Yeah. I mean, the, the size I've seen, you know, your average fish is probably in that eight to 10 pound range, pretty typical of coho. Um, I've seen fish up to, you know, 15, 16 pounds. Uh, we had a 17 pounder wild fish caught in one of our broodstock collection this year. Uh, and then, you know, jack, all the way down to jacks that are, you know, a couple of pounds. So a uh, wide range, but they're pretty typical in that eight to 10 pound range. Plus or minus. Yeah, but if they're coming back later, we're seeing bigger fish, which is is a bonus. Mo, mo, most of them are coming back later. Yeah, they'd have an extra few weeks of feeding out in the ocean. So, they, I mean, we haven't – I couldn't go back and compare the size to previous the previous stock, uh, you know, one for one. But uh, they're nice fish for sure. Yeah. And they should be uh, – they should be more aggressive and uh, – and, and certainly providing a longer fishery in the fall than in the past. And we just, similar to the steelhead, we've kind of shifted the timing a little bit uh, compared to that kind of the traditional coho on the coast here. So Mike had a question, how did the department produce more steelhead and salmon in the seventies and eighties and why can that happen again? I think you probably answered that with the conservation plan and, and the constrictions that the department is faced with. Is yeah, I think you have to remember that back then there was a lot of uh, pre-smolt and fry releases too. 
Uh, everything we do these days is full term smolts to get them to the to give them their best chance of survival and to minimize interactions with wild fish. So there was a lot of a lot of widespread stocking of a lot smaller fish, which you can do more of in the same space back then. And and uh, it didn't really I don't think it worked as well as what we thought it was going to do. And and certainly these days we have to get them to a certain size, at least to be able to mark them. So, uh, you know, that the, they'd be available to anglers when they come back, at least those fisheries that depend on hatchery fish like the coho and the steelhead, spring chinook. So, yeah. Um, one of the things that we all face, uh, whether it's um, the department or conservation groups like uh, CCA is uh, young angler recruitment. Um, and is, are there any opportunities or programs that the department um, is creating um, or has created specific to the North Coast um, that kind of that speaks to that um, angler recruitment? I don't, I, we do a, a number of things, but I don't know if it's specific to the North Coast. Um, we host a couple of family fishing events in the springtime. Uh, there's multiple free fishing day events that occur. Uh, we do some interaction with kids in classrooms, not always directly related to fishing, but you know, regarding either uh, either related to salmon or fish in their life cycles, or in a lot of cases, our eggs to fry program that we do in the classrooms so that we're introducing kids to to fish. Uh, but in terms of actual angling, I'd say it's primarily our fishing events that. We participate in in the spring and uh, 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 either either specifically the family fishing events or the events associated with the free fishing weekend in early June. Okay. Yeah. Um, John Zell has a question. Um, the he wants to know if the uh, anglers and guides they participate in the brood sock collection program for the uh, for coho. Is that correct? Yes, we, uh, most of our angler caught coho are actually on dedicated days where we gather a small group of folks and head out, um, uh, at least on the Trask River. We, we fish some areas that are otherwise closed to uh, folks and we're able to collect a good chunk of our fish that way. Um, but we do have folks who are, are able out there are out there collecting coho uh, similar to what we do with steelhead where they put them in live tanks and then drop them off. Um, and then we also collect some fish at trap sites. Um, but the bulk of the angling caught ones on the, on the Trask at least are from organized fishing days that we, we get folks together and go out and, you know, we'll do that two to three days a week through late October from till mid December. So some of the guides put their collection tank in their boat if they're fishing in the bay and put a wild collected coho in that tank and bring to you? Um, not in the bay. We, we do not want to collect fish out of the bay. The, uh, the mortality rate is likely to be too high on those fish when they're that fresh. We need to have fish that have entered the river, their scales have set, they're getting closer to spawning, they're better able to handle the, the handling uh, and survive till spawning. The, the unique thing about that program is we are, uh, because they're federally listed, we are limited to a specific number of fish that we can collect. Uh, and so we are capped. When we hit that number, we're done. And then we, if we have problems keeping it, you know, we've been lucky the first three years, we had really good survival and we were able to spawn and get all the eggs that we needed. Now that we have the F1, we call them the returning hatchery fish that are from wild parents. Now we can incorporate those into our program if we need them, similar to what we do with the steelhead spawning hatchery fish as backups. Uh, but we are capped on the number of wild fish 
in the given year. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to, uh, to make you get them to survive to, until the day they spawn. And so, yeah, so we do we do collect them by angler, have anglers collect them, but just not out of the bay. Okay. Does anybody have any more questions? So we're getting close to wrapping this up. Um, and we do have our trivia question um, to to ask, but does anybody have any more questions for Robert? Uh, let's see. Uh, David just asked, uh, yeah, this is a good question. Um, what's the status of the listing of the fall Chinook on uh, North Coast? Um, well, unknown to me, that went to uh, NIMFS like a year ago or a little more, and all the coordination with them has been through our uh, headquarters. I have not heard an announcement on their decision yet, so still pending. It's the best answer I can give at this point. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, do we have any more questions? Because I'm I want to wrap it up. I know Robert's time is valuable, and um, Jim, go ahead. Jim, do you have a question? Jim Kennedy. Yes. No, I just wanted to thank Robert and uh, from the presentation and information. Remind everybody he gave the information for the website to uh, get more detail, and this is recorded, and you can go back and watch it uh, probably as soon as tomorrow or the next day on the CCA website. So appreciate it, and uh, thanks for everybody joining. Well, uh, before we wrap it up, we, we do have a trivia question, and uh, the prize is a CCA hat and a coast headlamp. Um, I'm going to give Robert first crack at this. See, uh, see if he might know. Um, um, and then after, I'm going to give Robert about uh, ten seconds to answer this question. And if he doesn't answer, maybe he knows it. Maybe he doesn't want to answer it. But um, put your answers in the um, chat box. Um, and again. Um, before, don't let me forget to get your address uh, so we can send you the hat and the headlamp. Um, so the question is, Robert, you get, like I said, 10 seconds. And um, uh, what is the oldest known fish hatchery in Oregon? Oh, boy. Oldest known fish hatchery. Yeah, okay. five seconds. I, 10 seconds is probably up. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Question. All right. Everybody else uh, chime in. And what year? Yeah, the year it's, 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 I'll tell, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll do um, the, if you get the year within 10 years, or if you even get the, um, uh, the hatchery will uh, make sure you get the um, prize. Uh, David is close on the year. Steve is close on the year. So it's somewhere between 1860 and 1880. I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> All right. Um, All right, we're getting there. All right, so the answer is the Indian Creek Fish Hatchery. It was established in 1877. Um, and uh, from my notes here is it is on the Rogue River. So um, I'm gonna go to Brian who said 1872. So Brian, you are the winner of the headlamp and the CCA hat. So Brian, would you message me and give me your address and I will make sure that uh, Don New um, sends you your prize. All right, everybody. Um, this was great, Robert, great information. 
appreciate the time. Um, and like I said, the the North Coast is is uh, a very obvious popular uh, fishery. Um, and how many angler days, by the way, do you think are on the North Coast? <laughs> do you have any idea of that? Uh, throughout it for all species over an entire year. Or, uh, let's since we're talking uh, steelhead, just um, steelhead. Boy, on the north, we're not going to hold it to you. Just curious, more than anything, uh, it's got to be tens of thousands. I'm sure. Uh, we don't have any like formal creel surveys or anything like that. I'd have to. I could maybe add up uh, all of the catch across the north coast and extrapolate to how many days per fish or something like that but yeah no it's uh, it's a hard number 150,000 uh, that might be a little high for steelhead but it, I also wouldn't be totally surprised <laughs> uh, I right. bet there's especially with steelhead I'll bet there's some variation year to year as uh depending on weather conditions uh, you know how long people are off the water that sort of thing but but lots it's yeah. it's heavily fished for sure all right. All right, everybody, I appreciate you coming on board. Um, and um, again, um, where'd he go? Brian, I need your uh, address. Did you send it to me yet? All right, um, you guys can go ahead and check out. I'll wait for the address to come. Um, and Brian, if you need to email it to me, um, my email is phoglin at ccaoregon.org. Thanks again, Robert. Yeah, well, thanks, Chad, okay. for hosting tonight. Yeah, you're welcome. And if you want me to stop sharing my screen then, I guess? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks, thanks, Robert. Really appreciate it. Right well, on time. You did good, Pat. <laughs> thank <laughs> you it took a little bit i apologize for the uh uh, uh there's, there's the real joke. Um, <laughs> the good thing is 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 like i think i just fired myself from this role no no, no. <laughs> that will put you on third backup that schmuck they had doing it before really doesn't know what he's doing trust me so <laughs> Yeah, he's still he's still halfway down in Argentina somewhere. I don't think he's all the way back. Hey, what did we say? All right. all right. Appreciate it all. Perfect, you guys. I'm going to end it, and I'm going to stop recording, and um, I will get this to uh, Wade, and he's going to um, put it up uh, on our uh, YouTube page. Thanks again, Robert. Yeah, yeah you know, I'll just – if there's questions on there that were not answered that you want me to – you know, if you can send me the ones out of the chat or something, I can try to respond to it somehow. You can post it or or encourage people to get hold of me directly or what have you. But I don't want to leave anybody. I know we were on time frame there, so if there's things I can answer for folks. Just I'll I'll give it my shot, best shot if uh, if you want. Robert, if those things come in, like I said earlier, the communication committee, we're trying to work a way through. Uh, so we don't leave anybody's questions hanging. So appreciate it. And uh, you've shared your emails and contacts, so they can always go that route. Yeah. All right. Okay. Great. All right. Sounds good. Pat, good stay. Good evening. thank you guys. Pat, um, do you have, when you do the recording, what you're going to find out is it takes quite a while to grind it out. <laughs>